Welcome to the Victor Emanuel Nature Tours webinar. I am Ben Reynolds, producer and host of the event webinar series. Thank you for joining today's presentation. We are delighted to offer this exciting opportunity to experience the heart of Central Asia. The detailed itinerary for this departure may be found and downloaded in the handout section in the control bar. Now let's welcome our presenter, Mikhail Valkenberg. Hello, Mikhail. Hi, guys. Mikiel Valkenberg was born in 1982 in the southern province in the Netherlands, where encouraged by his parents, he began birding at an early age. During his teens, he studied landscape ecology and began performing bird surveys with the Dutch Center for Field Ornithology. During this period, he started traveling outside of Holland, first to Greece, Hungary, Romania, Scotland, and Morocco. Later, his birding travels took him extensively outside of Europe into Western Africa and further east to Russia and Kazakhstan. He lived in Kazakhstan for over 20 years, but moved back to Europe several years ago with his wife, Bonnie. They now reside in, in Valencia on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. From Central Asia, he ventured further with Southeast Asia and India, becoming favorite destinations. Mikhail has developed an expertise in the natural history of Asia. Along with birds, a good part of his attention is also given to butterflies, dragonflies, and mammals. Mikhail speaks four languages, has good people and logistic skills, and he is a natural born bird guide. He loves to explore new destinations and show birds to his fellow birders. He has a keen eye and an excellent ear for bird sounds. Mikhail is noted for his calm and respectful social approach, providing a good atmosphere during time in the field. Without further ado, we will turn to Mikhail's presentation. Thank you, Ben, for introducing. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody for joining this webinar, and I'm very thrilled to show you my very favorite region of the world. First of all, I'm very grateful to be working for Vent since 2015 and to focus on leading tours in the old world for this wonderful company. I live mainly in Asia and Africa. For Vent, I have developed the most extensive birding trip offered to Central Asia of all birding tour companies. We travel to the very best locations of Central Asia and in 23 days, we show you all the highlights the region has to offer. I believe it is the longest of all vent tours on offer. We focus on culture, birds, and general wildlife. We basically stop for everything beautiful. In short, we visit all the very best places in Central Asia in the look style you are used to of vent tours. The dates for the upcoming tours are set and shown here on the first slide. Let's start our uh, exploration. A question we leaders receive almost on every tour is what are your favorite places in the world to go birding? Mine are for sure Borneo, Kenya, but most of all Central Asia. We start our tour in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. We stay for a week in Uzbekistan, focusing primarily on the culture and do some birding. Culture will have the upper hand, but we will still focus on some extraordinary birds like finches wheat here, yellow-breasted deserted, and Turkestan ground jay. After Uzbekistan, we fly to Kazakhstan, and here we focus on the burning around Almaty in the southeast part of the country. We make a short three-night trip into Kyrgyzstan, where we focus on the Himalayan mountain species. Afterwards, we return to Kazakhstan and fly north to the capital of Kazakhstan, Astana. Recently, they have changed the name once again to Astana, after it was called Nur Sultan, the first name of the first president of Kazakhstan. Please note that on this map there is a minor mistake, as we changed the departure and the itinerary recently. We are not going by way of Bishkek back to Almaty, but we are going the same way back from Karakol to Almaty. We do this because they are developing a new road near Almaty, and it would take a long time to drive back. Uh, 
let's start our presentation here. Um, so in 2005, I made my first trip to Central Asia. After my university years, I was searching for adventure and ended up in Kazakhstan after spending some time in the Caucasus region. I crossed the Caspian Sea, Caspian sea from Azerbaijan. At 23, I started my burden tour company in Kazakhstan and I lived in Kazakhstan for about 14 years. I was based in Almaty, the largest city of the country. During this long period, I was rather active in the expat community and have never heard of any crime or hostilities towards foreigners. Locals are very open to visitors, which is part of their traditions. For example, when making a table for a meal, they always add an extra plate for a welcome stranger or traveler. I think the Silk Road played a large part in these traditions. On every tour it happened, that we are burning in a small village and a farmer or goat herder, herder wants to invite us in for tea or vodka to listen to our travel stories and to get acquainted with the strangers visiting his lands. The vodka is something that is introduced during the Soviet times. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, European birders have been visiting the region. American birders are lately discovering this natural beauty, culture and birds that this beautiful region has to offer. I think it is one of the, uh, the safest places for Americans to travel to in the old world. It is a very welcoming region and just a pleasure to travel. As I live mostly in Kazakhstan, I like to start with Kazakhstan. In the past 18 years, I have spent every May month in Central Asia. We all know how important May is for birding in the Northern Hemisphere. I have led around 70 birding tours in almost two decades to Central Asia. As I lived in Kazakhstan, I run my own birding tour company and consequently traveled the whole region so extensively that I received the nickname Mr. Central Asia. Spring is of course the best time to travel and the weather is lovely with no summer heat. In the summers, it can get around 110 Fahrenheit, while during the days of our ventures, the heat peaks at 98 Fahrenheit which is very comfortable and perfect birding weather. When we are in the mountain areas, temperatures can drop to freezing. So please dress accordingly. I think for this tour, it is best to dress and bring many layers. There are many reasons to visit Central Asia, but for us birders, the unparalleled spring migration occurring in the Northern Hemisphere and the major birding highway that runs through Kazakhstan is probably the main reason. Millions of birds migrate north from their wintering grounds in East Africa, Middle East, and India. They use the many wetlands as stopover. A little later in this webinar, I will focus more on this. In Kazakhstan, we find a large amount of difficult to find species. These species are specific for Central Asia and are almost impossible to find elsewhere. Very rare European birds like rosy starling, bimaculated lark or pedifield wolver. I'd like to give an extra mention to the massive wader migration with millions of waders migrating north, all in breeding plumage. Instead of the boring gray wintering plumage we see most of the year, we see instead groups of thousands of extravagant and chanting waders in breeding plumage. We see loads of rough temming stints and Kuralu sand peepers on this tour. These are with the most attractive waders in the world. There's a lot of overlap with West Polyarctic birds in Central Asia. We find families that occur also in Europe, like wagtails, pipits, most European warblers, and buntings, like the red headed bunting shown on the first slide. The whole experience of bird migration in Central Asia is one of a kind and something you must have experienced at least one time in your life. In Kazakhstan, we have a domestic flight of two hours planned to fly north to visit the feather grass terps around the capital. We end our tour here, and it is one of the best places for birding, the dessert of this amazing expedition. We continue our journey to Kyrgyzstan. The time in Kyrgyzstan is focused on finding the mountain species of this country. 
30% of the country is above 9,000 feet and the best place to find the mountain birds of the region. Extra birds that occur are resident species or hardcore Himalaya species like ruby throats, rose finches, teeth warblers, and snowcock. We will spend a lot of time walking and climbing in these beautiful mine mountains. And here on the slide, we have a gorgeous white tailed ruby throat, which is uh, my very favorite species of the region. Then we head for Uzbekistan, history of the Great Silk Road. Uzbekistan is home to the very attractive Silk Road cities of Bukhara and Samarkand. We start our exploration of the region in Uzbekistan. The Silk Road history is the main reason for visiting Uzbekistan. As mentioned earlier, we focus mainly on the Silk Road history during our visit to Uzbekistan. The Silk Road started around 150 before Christ with the Han Dynasty traveling west to trade. They traded with the Roman Empire and Persian nations. Around the year 1500, the Silk Road trading network came to an end because the Ottoman Empire started taxing the traders passing through their empire. The Europeans consequently took to the seas and discovered new routes to go east. The Silk Road became obsolete and an era came to an end. What I very much enjoy about Uz Uzbekistan, besides the culture, is the cuisine, which this country is known for in the region. The city-states developed trades and also developed a better cuisine compared to the nomad cuisine of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. During our tour, I think it is more than welcoming to enjoy their lovely and delicious foods. I have picked some of the best places for lunch and dinner, and I would love to show you the best they have to offer. During this webinar, I will guide you on a virtual tour along the stands in Central Asia. We consequently visit Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. So let's start with the slides I have prepared. On this slide, we see an Azertid, the Registan Square in Samarkand and a Turkestan Red Pika. The tit is a race of Azertid showing an, an all yellow breast. The fluffy pectus race is sometimes regarded as a species. Clemens, however, treats it still as a race. The Registan Square is the most impressive cultural site we come across during the tour. We will visit the square twice, dur during dusk and dawn. These moments give a different lighting to the turquoise tiles of the madrasa. Just an amazing feature. We will find 50 shades of blue. I never knew there were so many shades of blue until I visited Uzbekistan. The last image of the Turkestan red pika is one of the mammals we hopefully find during this trip. Pikas are a small mammal with the majority of the family living and occurring in China. We have, we have chance on one species and this is the cute little red Turkestan red pika. They are very approachable and when sitting next to the entry to their nest or hole, they will come out and walk beside you when you make no noise and sit totally silent. We will try this during our stay in Kyrgyzstan, as they are a pure mountain mammal. So we start our travels in Uzbekistan, and we travel to Tashkent, and stay in the lavish Hyatt Hotel. The hotel is located in the center of the city, and you will find several parks nearby, which are good for birding, and a lovely afternoon stroll. In the park, we can expect birds like Hume's leaf warbler, Blight's reed warbler, and Turkestan tit. The Hyatt has a lovely roof restaurant which serves European and local meals. Here we have a good spot to photograph alpine swifts soaring high over our heads. Photography is anyway excellent in Central Asia. If you, if you bring photo gear, I always recommend to bring minimum 300 millimeter with a 1.4 converter to get close enough to the many opportunities during this three-week tour. On our first day of the tour, we travel to Samarkand. We start driving after breakfast and leave Tashkent behind us. We will stop en route for the first white storks and blue cheek bee eaters. We will arrive just before lunch to Samarkand, where we check into our hotel that is close to the Registan Square. 
In the afternoon, we enjoy a guided walk by a certified local guide. We visit the mausoleums and madrasa of this ancient city. A splendid experience also for the most hardcore burger. The Registan Square was built in the 15th century, therefore at the end of the Silk Road route. The Registan was a cultural and religious center with three madrasas. A madrasa is a religious university from Persia. The dome in the Tilya Kori Madrasa is the most beautiful and breathtaking of all domes in the country. I personally believe it's the most beautiful in the entire empire. The Golden Dome is breathtaking and the detail of the tiles is out of this world. When we in Europe were still running around in bearskin and living in small huts in Central Asia, a sophisticated and science-focused society was booming. In the Registan, we roam and take our time visiting this wonderful location. If you like, you can do it in your own time and your own pace. We mention a time to be back again at the main gate and here we come together before heading back to our hotel. As you can see on these images, the, the Registan and the dome, they're just absolutely wonderful. One of my favorite spots in terms of culture in Central Asia. And here is another image of the Registan Square. But this is the inside. So inside the madrasa of the Registan, we find painters, sculptors, and carpentry shops. All of them will welcome you into their shop in the hope of selling you some of their products. Some paintings are very good, and I bought some myself here in the past. The final image here of the Registan Square this photo was made during the corona period, therefore we see very little visitors. Uh, in the afternoons, it's always busier than the morning. The morning visit will be the best as we will be almost all alone. We will be there around 6 a.m. As you can see, a spectacular location. On top of the domes, peregrine falcons are breeding, and sometimes we see the hunt, the, uh, the very common local alpine swifts. A wonderful spectacle and a challenge sometimes to get them in the bins. Both are with the fastest flying birds in the world. So this is the statue of Timur in the center of the city. Timur was a Turco-Mongol conqueror who founded the Timurid Empire in and around modern day Central Asia, becoming the first ruler of the Timurid dynasty. An undefeated commander, and he is widely regarded as one of the greatest military leaders and tacticians in history as well as one of the most brutal. During the Vent Maharaja Express train trip, we visit the Princess of Wales Museum, where the battle armor of Timur is presented. It includes some very pointy and sharp swords. A great experience, and I can definitely recommend joining the India train trip. And then the next day, we go burning in the morning. So on our full day in Samarkand, we start with an early transfer south to the Tahtakaracha Pass. And here we spend most of the morning till lunch. We make short walks in these glowing green hills and we focus on finding the white-throated robin. This gorgeous robin is mostly found on the ground and is always bopping its tail. It never really sits still. Other birds here include, include Eastern Rock Nut Hatch, White Cap Bunting, and Eastern Orphan Wobbler. Itachta Karacha Pass is a very green location and just a perfect birding spot for our first morning in the field. We'll do some minor uphill walking, but nothing strenuous. The spring weather will be amazing and the birding easy and rewarding. It's just a splendid morning. Furthermore, we try to chase down Finch's wheat ear. The pass is the only place where we can find this rare wheat ear. It is the only location on the tour where we have chances on finding this striking white and black bird. The species showcased here is the pike wheat ear, which is very similar. However, Finch's wheat ear has an all white back, whereas this pike has a black back. In the early afternoon, we return to Samarkand for lunch and another fully guided culture walk to the many mausoleums of this intriguing city. I think some of you joining this webinar have been to India 
and have subsequently visited the wonderful Taj Mahal Mausoleum. The Taj was built by one of the grandsons of Timur using the same style as in Samarkand, which the capital of the Timurid Empire. The Taj is one building, whereas Samarkand has a whole center filled with mini Taj buildings. I mentioned this to compare the size of this UNESCO World Heritage Monument. You will be stunned all the time by the grandness of this location. Something completely and totally unique. The next morning, we travel to Bukhara, where we have some burning in wetlands along the way. We search for clamorous wheat warbler and white-tailed lapwings, but also pooded eagle and maybe steppe eagle will be the first Aquila raptors of this tour. In the afternoon, we explore the city of Bukhara. The whole center of the city is an UNESCO World Heritage Site. We will not use our vehicle and can walk to all sites from our centrally located hotel. The lobby house pool was a place for gathering where the elders of the city met. Also, the pool was the fresh water supply for the population of the town. The system was developed in the Persian Empire, of which Bukhara was part for a long period. Bukhara is mainly a trading city in the extensive sand desert of Kizilkum. Near the pool, we will enjoy all our meals and breathe the culture of this amazing place. Our hotel is located uh, a mere 100 yard walk away. If you like to make a stroll after dinner on your own, it is for sure possible. This place is very safe and the people are very friendly and welcoming. It happens that a lot of students will start a chat to find out about the places where you're from. Many of the people here, and the youth especially, they speak English. One of my favorite places in Bukhara is the Kalam Mosque. It's again close to our hotel and only a 10 minute walk away. Kalam means the foot of the great one, with which they mean Allah. The complex consists of three parts, the Kalam Mosque, the Kalam Minaret, to which the name refers to, and the Mir Arab Madrasa. But the positioning of the three structures creates a square courtyard and in its center, with the Mir Arab and the Kalam Mosque standing on opposite ends. In addition, the square is enclosed by a bazaar and a set of baths connected to the Mar Minaret, and the northern and southern ends respectively. Both the Kalam Mosque and Minaret were initially commissioned by Arslan Khan in 1121, with the famed Kalam Minaret concluding construction in 1127. However, Genghis Khan destroyed the original Friday Mosque in 1220, leaving only the Kalam Minaret untouched. Here, a friend of mine on, the, on this image, just please have a look at the, at the massive detail of all the tiles in this, this entry of the dome. Furthermore, food. One of my favorite things in the world besides birding is food. And uh, therefore a little bit of attention to Uzbek food, uh, especially plof, which is a signature exists for this region. Every na nation in Central Asia will prepare it in its own way, but I prefer the Uzbek way with roast meats, which are mostly lamb or beef. Uh, we will try this dish and have lunch in a plof center and enjoy this meal with fresh bread and a cold beer during this uh, full day where we start the day with birding. This will be a welcoming lunch. Then the next day we are here, we have a very early start. We'll see us leave Bukhara and head west into the Kilkum Desert, which is freely translated as red sand, a massive and desolate place. We bird the sandy dunes of this vast desert. We search for enigmatic species like Manatrices warbler, long tail shrike, pied bush shed, and streaked scrub warbler. But the largest target of this place is the Turkish tongue ground jay. It is one of the four species of ground jay in the world, and we have a very good chance of coming across the species, or even this very same individual. As you can see in the image of the bird, the upper mandible of this individual is missing. I found it three years ago and I thought it would never survive. However, a year later, I found it again and again another year later. The mandible is not growing, but the bird feeds and survives without. 
a tough bird male for sure. Furthermore, the desert flora will receive from attention as well. If we are lucky and it had rained the days before our visit, we will be on the lookout for flowering desert flora. The specific species that is shown in this image of broom rape has a rotten meat smell attracting flies. This is how it pollinates. Besides interesting, it is also a very beautiful plant. This day is also very good for reptiles and especially later in the day when it starts to heat up. We will take some time and hopefully we can make some beautiful images. After that, we return to Tashkent by way of a new fast bullet train from Spain. It's the same train that, uh, that rides here in my new hometown of Valencia to, to Madrid. In the morning, we visit some wetlands and in the hope to score the marble teal. In the afternoon, we return to Tashkent with 200 miles an hour in all luxury. Then our final full day in, in Uzbekistan. Uh, we are heading for the lush hills near the capital, which are called the Chingan Hills. A wonderful day and a great contrast when comparing to the last days in Bukhara. Uh, Indian paradise flycatcher breeds here. Uh, it will be one of the main targets, but also the, yellow, the, the beautiful yellow-breasted tit is a major target. Around us, rock buntings will be ticking, common quails are calling loudly, and Hume's leafholders are busy migrating north to their breeding grounds in West Siberia. A very beautiful bird is this uh, yellow-breasted deserted. Lots of character as well. If you use playback, they come in very quickly, and they're very fierce. Then... We have a travel day planned. We are moving from Tashkent, Tashkent to Almaty. We leave Uzbekistan behind us and we fly to Kazakhstan. Our destination here will be the city of Almaty, the greenest city of Central Asia. We stay in the amazing Mercure Hotel, which is an Italian chain. In the city, I take you to my favorite restaurant for a lovely outing in the city. Almaty is a wonderful place and a very booming with the latest fashion. There are lots of nice, cozy restaurants, and I love living here, and I'm very happy. The city and the people are now a big part of my life. I'm, for example, also married to a Kazakh beauty. Then the next day, we, our first full birding day in Kazakhstan, we travel east, and uh, it brings us to the Chinese border. We visit here the Kokpek Pass, Sugeti Valley, and the Charin Canyon. These locations are our birding places for the coming days. We do our best to find gems like blue rock thrush, Mongolian finch, Asian crimson winged finch, and palace of sand grouse. We stay in a lovely basic lodge with some authentic atmosphere. The Eurasian sculpture, as shown on this image, breeds in the garden, and after dinner, we have a small excursion plan to photograph this beauty. The garden is full with olive willows, which have a specific scent. After a long cold winter, spring has returned and the willows are blossoming. Here we listen as well to the wonderful song of the Eastern Nightingale, which is a race of common nightingale. The call is similar to Trush Nightingale of Eastern Europe. We sometimes see the latter in Taukum Desert during migration. Before reaching the guest house, we focus on finding Mongolian finch and Asian crimson finch. We do so at artesian wells in the, in the Sogeti Valley. Every evening, tens of birds come here to drink. My experience is that on every 50 Mongolian finches, we are lucky to find one crimson winged. The crimson winged is far rarer. It is a lot bigger than the Mongolian and also has a different call. I mostly can pick them up on several hundreds, hundreds of yards away, just before they drop in for a small sip of water, which mostly does not last longer than 10, 15 seconds. Another massive target uh, is the palace of sand grouse. We sometimes find them, but I have another place where I think they are easier. Anyway, with luck, we also find them the same evening. 
The next day, we enjoy a full day of birding in the Sugeti Valley and Charing Canyon. The canyon is around 100 miles in length and located in the Uyghur Uyghur district. A Muslim minority living on the border of China and Kazakhstan. They are known as very good traders and businessmen. In the canyon, we will find colorful and peculiar rock formations formed by the weathering of sedimentary rock. Although being a lot smaller, it has been described as equally impressive as the Grand Canyon uh, that you find back home in the United States. The gray neck bunting, which is pictured here on the right, is a top target in this place next to the lesser kestrel and sometimes even we, we find wolf. Rufus still rock thrush and pied wheat here are equally common. We do not make a walk in the canyon as the other places are more interesting for birds. We do have lunch here and make time for some images. The Sogeti Valley is mostly the first place in the morning that I like to visit with a birding group. It is an eolic formation, which means that for thousands of years, the wind was in control and blew all the tiny sand granules away, which resulted in a stony desert. As you can imagine, this place again holds a particular avifauna that can survive in such unique habitat. We searched for Isabeline wheat ears, tawny pipit, and Sykes' warbler. Most will be new for this tour. Also, the all-white horned larks here are very special. They are part of the Penicillata group. The Sugeti is a very vast place and we will be all alone with no people surrounding us. I can imagine if you live in a very densely populated area such as Los Angeles or New York, that you find Sugeti a magical place. On the left picture, you see a few birds in the front, but nothing else but vastness. Sometimes we come across some local kids on a horse that are interested in this new Silk Road travelers that visit their playing garden. Very cute and very lovely kids over here. Then we leave Sogeti behind us and we leave Kazakhstan behind us and we, the next day we drive to Karakol, a small city located in eastern Kyrgyzstan. We cross the border, which is a routinely and easy crossing in the middle of nowhere. During this day, we are mainly surrounded by a wonderful scenery. I guess similar to scenery from Alaska. At least I've never been to Alaska, but what I've seen of images and previous webinars, it is very similar. The city of Karakol was formerly known as Przewalski. It was a former military Russian outpost from the 1800s. It's a small town with 85,000 people on the eastern shores of the Issaquah Lake which is the second highest mountain lake after Mount Lake Ishikawa in Peru. It's the fourth largest city of Kyrgyzstan. We'll use the city as a base during our explorations of the mountains surrounding the city. And as you can see on the image, we might be coming across some different traffic than you are used to in the USA. During our stay in Karakol, we, we use a lovely guest house, which is ran by a local couple who lived for many years in Japan. The wife is Japanese and together they run the guest house. Everything is on time and everything is simply perfect for the needs of bird watchers. Also, you will find there those beautiful, special uh, Japanese toilets with 20 different functions. Horses were and are important to the nomadic lifestyle, which is found in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. Horses are used for milk and meat. The hat the herder is wearing is made from horse fur. Sometimes we come across a group of horsemen playing the game of koppa, which is similar to polo. Instead of a bull, they use a headless sheep as a bull. Back in the days of Genghis Khan, this was the sport the men practiced to improve their horse riding skills. The army of Genghis was so formidable because of the use of horses. Back in those days, it were modern day tanks, which were highly efficient in def defeating the enemy. As we are leaving Kazakhstan and its dry deserts behind, we return into the green fields with a gorgeous, colorful wildflower mountain scenery, as seen on this image. 
Also, there are lots of wild rivers making their way down, down towards the towards the Issaco Lake, coming from the nearby high altitude mountains. The tops of some of these mountains reach far above 20,000 feet and are the highest in the world. So we have two full days to burn the mountains around Karakol. Uh, we focus on the Chonashu Pass in the Barscone Gorge. So the first day we head for Chonashu, where this amazing lumber guy is seen yearly by groups led by me. These vultures are a bone marrow specialist. They feed mainly and only on bone marrow. So they drop the bones that they found in the mountains from a very large hive on, a, on, a, on the hard rocks, splitting them open, open and devouring them. Also, the birds have white breast feathers, but bathed in iron rich water, giving them this wonderful orange rusty color. Uh, on this slide, we see the, the habitat we will be burning in during those days. This is what we'll be focusing on. So we focus mainly on juniper scrub to find our targets. White-tailed ruby throat, red-mantled rose finch, white-winged rose beak, and the mega target is for sure white-browed tit warbler. Please note that on the next slide, you mostly see all birds' pictures sitting on the juniper. A very important habitat and always a pleasure to bird in. The weather here can change quickly, therefore it is wise to have many layers, layers of cloning at hand. We do a little bit of climbing here, but most of the time I like to stay on the, on the edges, on the, on the lower areas and just use the scope. Basically, if I step out of the car, I listen. If I hear birds ticking or calling, and then we'll decide if we go further up or not. But most of the time, I just like to use my scope. And this is it. Here's the picture of our mega target, the white browed titwaller. It is a tiny wren-like bird with, with a bopping tail. However, when it was a young, it fell into a disco dip. It is a major bird to find and to witness in reality. We do our utmost best to find the species for you on this tour. It's one of the major avifaunal highlights. It's absolutely splendid. And it occurs throughout most of the Himalaya region. If you've been to the very, very north of India in Ladakh, it's possible that you've seen it there. But they are very well, easier and more common as well in this area of Kyrgyzstan. So on this slide, we see the Chonashu uh, Valley with a small river cutting through the grasslands. This is the best place to find the magical ibis bill, one of the best birds of the planet. I think it fits it in, in the same list as birds of paradise, kagu, rockfowl, or cock of the rock. I have never missed this bird, so at least in this location. So I think our chances are good to find this beautiful ibis bill. So here it is. Here is a close-up of the ibis bill on the left image. This image was made in the same Chonashu Valley as shown in the previous slide. This ruby throat, however, is my personal favorite bird of Central Asia. This is also why I called my company after this species, ruby throat birding tours. It is a fierce species that migrates away to India, but returned by the end of April. Its song is similar to a nightingale, as it used to be in the same family, Lushinia. The gorgeous red gem on its throat is very striking. When using playback, they perch up and show very good. One of the, another highlight. The mountain areas are probably, when we are burning in these mountains, as you might know, in mountain areas, it's not every day that you see like hundreds and hundreds of individuals. There's a low amount of birds, but when you see a bird, it's always a spectacle. I think during the day when we see 40, 50 different individuals, but every species is amazing. So the second day in this region, we head up to the Barscone Gorge or better said the Barscone Mine. A Canadian company is mining gold in this mountain. It gives us the wonderful option to drive from 2,000 feet at the lake up to 12,000 feet in altitude. We will bird all the different habitats between these altitudes. 
All species we target are specialists of altitudes and are found at specific altitudes. So we make several different stops at different altitudes to find different species. We find common species like Blackistons pipit, which is a race of water pipit, and many forest birds like blue cap red start, Eversman's red start, and blue whistling thrush. Uh, a top target here is golden stud red start or white wing red start, which is found between large boulders and scree. A magnificent species of the race Grandis, Grandis meaning it is also the largest all of uh, all of the races in this species. Finally, another image of Lamagaya, one of my favorite vultures in the world. So here we have two uh, different species of uh, accentor. Brown accentor is found uh, around 11,000 feet and up, always between boulders, more or less in the same area as where we'll find sulfur belly warbler. Then black throated accentor is much lower. Uh, they have a call, which is also well, not very similar, but black throated accentor is always found lower in juniper scrub, whereas brown accentor is always above the tree line and above the line where the, uh, the juniper ends. Both, again, species that are specific for different types of altitude. Then another more commonly bird for the lower areas is brown dipper. They are uh, spectacular. Um, sometimes when, when they are feeding, we are lucky. We can put them in the scope and you can, you can see them foraging when they are dipping in the water and coming up with some insects. A common bird throughout the, uh, the entire tour is here is this white wagtail, the Persianata rage, sometimes called mast wagtail. You'll see them in Uzbekistan, at the Registan, and we'll see them all the way up here in the Barskong Gorge. They are very common. Uh, Red-billed chuff and then white-winged snow finch, two other species that are uh, further up. Uh, white winged snow finch is mostly above 12 to 13,000 feet, and we need to be lucky. We need to be lucky with snow. So, if it will be snowing, these birds are pressed down, and then we have more opportunities to find them together with species like Brand's mountain finch. This red bull chuff is common in the lower areas, and we'll for sure see one of those uh, beautiful acrobats. They are wonderful flyers. Then one of my very favorite birds, besides the ruby throat, is the sulfur belly warbler. A very beautiful, bright yellow supercilium. A very feisty little bird. They are uh, always on top. If you play a little bit of playback, they are immediately up. They don't need a little bit of a, a little push they need, and then uh, we get great views. Um, then we return to Almaty and we have a long uh, day driving ahead of us. We cross the border back into Kazakhstan uh, and in the evening we stay in the Mercury Hotel again where we enjoy some luxuries. During the drive we make some stops to watch a local bakery. Uh, we will find some birds in Willow Forest where white crown pendulum tit is breeding and oriental turtle dogs will mostly be perched on, the, on some electric wires. Another common bird of which I know a breeding spot is this uh, gorgeous azurtid. As you can see, this is the uh, Tenshanicus race, which is no yellow on the breast, but a small, tiny black dot. Uh, our final destination in the southeast of Kazakhstan is north of Almaty, and we head towards Balkhash Lake in the Taukum Desert. We leave Almaty and we drive by way of Sorbalak Lake to this vast clay desert, another habitat. During the drive, we pass vast fields of red-colored poppies with large amounts of rosy stones foraging on the, on the, on the crickets. Always we will we'll have the massive snow-capped mountains of the Tenshan in the back view mirror. At Sorbalak, uh, we'll probably find our first Terex sandpipers but also these rosy starlings that are shown here. Uh, the largest group of rosy starlings that I've ever found is probably over 100,000. So 100,000 of those beautiful white cones. 
Christmas balls flying around. Really wonderful bird. Then in Talkum, larks take over and will be in search in no less than eight species of larks with that magnificent bimaculated lark being the biggest prize, which is shown here on the left image. They are similar to calendar lark, but have a clearer supercilium and the column. The column of the bill is steeper. Just because I can't get enough of these birds, another image of rosy starlings, but then in flight. Very bright, just beautiful birds. We stay during our time in the desert in a youth camp. This is a tent camp made of felt and used by the nomadic local population in times of Genghis Khan. As there are no hotels available in this region, we have erected a camp especially for us. We will stay here all alone and we are nurtured by a professional staff and amazing cook whom will prepare amazing dishes for us in this unique location. In the morning, we start with some coffee and some cookies and we start burning right out of our bed. So most of the time I will just set up uh, my scope and I start searching here uh, the right area of the camp. Most of the times we find uh, Turkish tongue gazelle, wolf, McQueen's bustard, Caspian plover, greater sand plover, all in this location. It is, we are right in the middle of the wilderness and right in the middle of the show. At 5 a.m. we are waking up by the song of thousands and thousands of larks. So this is the inside of our dining yurt. As you can see, it is extremely colorful um, for people who have trouble with sitting on the ground. We can set up chairs and a regular, uh, a regular table. Here we'll have our meals. We have a rest because most of the time we have a little bit of a break after we come back from birding. We can make a little nap here. Most of the time we'll put more, more pillows so there are a lot of places also to take a nap. Then red-headed bunting, another favorite bird of mine. So it's found nearby our, uh, our camp. Uh, they are declining like most Asian buntings. They used to be really numerous but we have to search from them now. Uh, so most years, a few birds are breeding in the vicinity of the camp and they're all within a, a walking distance. And here, the next slide, we can see the, the main reason why are we staying in Taukum Desert. You see the, uh, the purple lines and the blue line are migration route of birds. In the, uh, the right upper corner, you have a complete white uh, area surrounded by green. This is the Himalaya mountains. It's a, a mountain massive that is uh, avoided by all birds. So birds that are wintering in India, East Africa, Northern Africa, and the Middle East, they all come together more or less in Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. And this is from here, they migrate north towards Western Siberia. We talk about tens of millions of birds that are migrating uh, over the Talkum Desert. And this is the main reason for us to spend time here. We are depending a little bit of weather. If we have rain, which is the best, then all birds come down, migration stops, and all bushes and trees are teeming with, with lots of birds. So it's a little bit of a relaxed birding here as well in Talkum Desert. So after our morning stroll near the camp, we are taking our bus, Mercedes Sprinter bus, which you can see in the, in the distance parked. Uh, we make a little walk and we go sit on top of these barhans, which are a little bit of a sandy dune. And we are using them to overview uh, an incoming uh, drinking birds like Pelasus sangrouse at an artesian well. Very comfortable, very easy. If we have something good, we step up, we go and have a look in the scope. We'll stay here probably for 45 minutes to an hour, just having a look at the, uh, the migration that is going on that day. It also gives me a little bit of an impression of what's happening with migration and where to go during that day or during that morning. Uh, two amazing species here, uh, Caspian plover. Many people will see it in Southern Africa when it's breeding, or uh, sorry, when it's uh, wintering. Uh, wintering birds, of course, all brown, no color. In Kazakhstan, it is uh, 
completely in breeding plumage. This is also the place where it breeds. One time we had a bird breeding 100 yards away from the camp. Absolutely stunning. Then an iconic bird as well is the step eagle. Uh, one of the largest, well, I think it's the largest Aquila eagle that breeds in Talcum Desert. We'll maybe uh, come across a few of those as well. Then Demoiselle Crane. We come across these Demoiselle Cranes, which are always near to the camp. They are the most attractive of all worldwide cranes, in my opinion, uh, especially if you should look at the eyes, the beautiful red eyes, which are not visible on this slide. But on the next, they will be. Look at the tufts, look at the breast feathers. It's just an amazing, perfect little crane. Then I was very lucky one time uh, when I had this pair of these demos, demosol cranes mating right in front of me. Uh, I was laying on the ground in the dirt, covered by a camouflage net. And it was absolutely aesthetic when this happened in front of me. Again, look at these beautiful, bright red eyes. Just an amazing bird. Uh, then we had after breakfast, so this is all happening before breakfast. After breakfast, around 10.30, we are uh, starting to drive, and we head 100 miles north towards Lake Balkhash and a, uh, an endangered populous diversifolia forest. So one of the main targets here is Saxel Sparrow, uh, which is a small desert sparrow. Uh, I have one spot and it is breeding inside of a uh, bus stop. So this is where we'll be posting. We'll play the tape, and then hopefully we'll have a, a beautiful sexual sparrow in the scope rapidly. Um, after this, we head to this forest. So Populus diversifolia is a Turanga forest. Uh, it's unfortunately, the forest is not doing very well. Uh, the water level is dropping which means that the forest is dying and slowly and slowly also the birds are disappearing. In the forest, so we are in the middle of a desert here. We have one forest and of course we immediately have a woodpecker. So this is a white-winged woodpecker. It's very, very similar to great spotted woodpecker from Europe, uh, only it has more wing or more white on the wing and the call is also almost like identical. It's very similar. It's a it's a typical dendrocopist call. Uh, one of the rarest birds of this forest is yellow-eyed dove. There are less than 20,000 individuals left of this species. Uh, the vast majority of this species winters in northern India. Uh, but we see them in breeding plumage here in the yellow-eyed dove in the Turanga forest. Probably one of the most spectacular uh, polyarctic doves. After coming back from this birding uh, bonanza in, uh, in Turanga Forest, we have dinner and then after dinner, we are heading out again. So we search for small mammals uh, and geckos. So a great jerboa, is a, it's like a small jumping mice. They are rather common on, on warm, uh, warm days, uh, no rain. That's one of the main things that we do not need during for, for finding these great jerboas. Uh, as you can see, you can get very close. I got a good spotlight with me, uh, and they freeze most of the time. Then another thing is that we head for the sandy areas near the camp, where we find frog eyed gecko or common wonder gecko. Uh, absolutely prehistoric looking, and uh, an inhabitant of the Central Asian deserts. After this, we have a next day. We return to Almaty. In the morning, we are. Uh, simply picking and looking at our list and then picking what we will do. If we are missing some species, we decide on, on the species where we are going. So we can go in further into the desert. We can go to the village to check the migration, maybe go into the dunes. It's all depending. And then after lunch, we are heading south. And by way of Sorbalat Lake again, we do some birding here. We head back to Almaty and to the Mercure Hotel. At Sorbalak Lake, we'll find some white pelicans and maybe Dalmatian pelicans. Uh, rare here is pygmy uh, cormorant. Other birds include here Temming Stint, which is one of the most common uh, waders migrating north. We'll have 
99% chance to get the species in close-up views. Then after, we have a domestic flight planned. It's a, a travel day where we fly to Nur Sultan, or formerly known Astana, and now back again to Astana. Uh, we, we fly with Air Astana, a new airline company. They were winner of the Skytrax Airline Award for best airline in Northern Asia. They are absolutely wonderful. New airplanes, good staff, all in English speaking, good food. So a two hour flight and we are in Astana. As you can see here on the map, it is uh, uh, around 1200 kilometers, which is about uh, 800 miles north of Almaty. So the distance Tashkent Almaty is closer than Almaty to Nusultan. And here's a picture of Astana. As the new government was afraid of an invasion from China, they transferred the capital from Almaty to the new city, which was named Astana. F first, it was called Selinograd, as it was named during the Soviet times. It had a mere 60,000 people. The newly developed city has over 1 million people and is still growing strong. It holds the wonderful record of being the second coldest capital in the world. Uh, after Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia, temperatures dropped to minus 40 Fahrenheit. Uh, the city consists of an all new groovy buildings and sometimes is referred to as the Dubai of Central Asia. The reason for us to fly north is to visit the Korgazin State Nature Reserve. In the Feathergrass Steppe, we go birding and are in search of spectacular birds like this black-winged pretting call. The reserve has over a hundred lakes and wetlands, a mega attraction for the birds during this migration north. All have a stopover in this area to tank and fatten up a little before flying further to their breeding grounds. We get up early and spend a full day exploring this amazing reserve. A big cherry on the pie might be coming across the prehistoric looking Saiga gazelle. Last year was an excellent year and we found several hundred during the vent tour. The black lark is a regional endemic. Uh, it's almost endemic, but females of the species, they migrate south and they reach Uzbekistan. Besides that, there's a small breeding population just over the border in the West in Russia. Um, it is probably, well, around Astana, it is for sure my favorite bird, uh, especially their uh, uh, display flights are unique. It is like a butterfly. They fly with very slow wing beats. They go up and they go down. It is just a thrill to watch and experience this. Then another species I like to mention is red-necked phalarope. They migrate in huge numbers. Uh, we'll for sure see thousands. So my largest group of this species has been 700,000 red-necked phalaropes. We had a couple of days of, of, of very bad weather. Migration stopped. And then on Tengis Lake, which is the largest lake, it has, um, it's around 40 kilometers wide, so around 20 miles wide. 25, uh, it was black. The whole lake was black with redneck phalaropes. That's amazing. I will never forget. And then to show you how rich these lakes are, I show you a picture of a step lake with a large group of foraging white winged terns. Uh, in the background, you see a former collective farm, and they were created during the Soviet times. Most of them are empty. Sometimes there are people living, but most of the times they are empty. Then another top target for the north is sociable lapwing, um, a very endangered plover. I believe there's only less than 4,000 individuals in the world. They unfortunately have a very, very bad migration route. So they breed in Kazakhstan with the largest uh, Quantity are, it, it's around Korgalshin village. I believe there are 200 birds here, which is 5% of the world population. And this village is no bigger than 4,000 people. Um, but the bird migrates 
towards the west after coming after being finished with breeding they go west they go north of the caspian sea and then they go immediately south so they go over georgia armenia azerbaijan then turkey syria lebanon jordan these areas uh, and unfortunately they love hunting there uh, so these birds are shot down and they've been fed to the to sparrow hawks uh, which is which is a known thing in that region uh, unfortunately but again one of the the top targets of the north and we'll do our utmost best to find the species and there is a, a sociable leopard project where they do a breeding and, and banding project we are in touch with those guys so most of the time we have an update about where to find which birds Then a magnificent experience altogether is to walk among thousands of flowering, colorful tulips. These shrank tulips flower mostly in the first weeks of May. The weather is important and this determines the period of flowering. This picture was made during the Venture in 2019. So these fields stretch for many miles as far as you can see. And it's almost a bright illusion in the middle of a green vastness. Again, another highlight of this amazing trip. When we are there, we'll keep in touch with local researchers to know if one of those fields is flowering. On our final day, we do some minor birding around Astana. Uh, we'll take some time to take images of these gorgeous red-footed falcons. They nest alongside the road between Korgalzin and Astana. We end the tour with a small city tour of Almaty and a wonderful final dinner in an authentic local restaurant. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank you for joining this event webinar about the unique region of Central Asia. I hope to welcome you coming May in Uzbek Uzbekistan, Tashkent. The tour has a guaranteed departure. If you have questions regarding the tour or this webinar, please let me know via Ben and I will answer with pleasure. Goodbye and be safe. And I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this webinar. Thank you.